Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Hallelujah. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> uh, it should be joyful to get into the Word. Yes. You know, John the Baptist says that his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. Amen. Well, I, I pray, before he prays, that uh, we would hear the voice of the bridegroom. Yes. Because it doesn't really matter what I have to say, it matters what God has to say. So... I will pre-pray by saying that, Lord, don't let anything come out of my mouth that you haven't put in my heart. Hallelujah. That I haven't heard from you. Amen. So we're continuing on in our study of the prophet Amos. This is uh, now I, our 15th time in, in this study. And I, I said it's very important because obviously what, what the prophet prophesied back then was certainly for that time, for that people, the Israelites. But it's also for us today. And it was it was an end times message for them. Yes. And I'm telling you, it's an end times yes. message for yes. us. Amen. Okay. So we left off last in our last session last week in the fifth chapter uh, in verses 11 and 12. And that's where we're going to pick it up again in this time. Uh, but before we do that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for being with us now. And we thank you for that we can be your bond servants. Yes. And Lord, just help us get from your word every single bit we can, because we need it. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's the Amen. truth. We need it. We, we need, need his word. Can't live without it. And it's, what did uh, we call it one time? An anti-stupid pill? Or for something? me it is. Yeah, it's an anti-stupid. Uh, you know, it says all mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. This is a... The, the word removes that stupidity from us because we we go in and we gain the understanding, the wisdom of God. So that's our desire. All right. So as I said, let's let's pick it up where we left off. I'm going to read from Amos chapter 5, starting at verse 11, 11 and 12. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact the tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm reading from the New American Standard, by the way. Okay, just so you, so you know. I, I, I will reference a lot of times the King James. Uh, but it, both are what we call kind of literal translations, trying to translate word for word. And, uh, I want to hear what God said, not what anybody else thinks he said or should have said. So here we're dealing with what God is dealing with in the time of Amos up in the north in Israel is corruption. Mm. It is, it's a moral corruption, it's a religious corruption, and it is a political corruption. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Much like today. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. I didn't have to. Much like today. And that's, that's the truth. Yes. Okay. All right. And we talked about what's what's happening here is that the, the wealthy are oppressing the poor for their own gain, their own benefit. Right. And I said in this study, I've said a couple of times now, this is not about, it's not a social gospel. It's a gospel. Right. There's it's, only one gospel. Yeah. There's the good the news gospel. of Jesus Christ. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So, and we, we ended last week talking about the fact that God's love is rooted in giving, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And I, I, I said, I remember these words I said at the end of last week, was that you, you can't love without giving. Mm. You can certainly give without loving. That's right. Okay? Yes. So... We have to have that focus. What motivates us has to be the love of God. Okay. You know, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 13 talks about if he does all of these things and works the, the miracles, the gifts of the Spirit, but doesn't have love, it profits nothing. It's like a clanging symbol, all right? So we're not to love because it makes us feel good, although it, it absolutely should. We're not to mm -hmm. give because it makes us feel good, although it absolutely should. But we are to love the brethren and our neighbors, mm -hmm. and, and our, our enemies. enemies. Yes. <laughs> and it, it, you know, if you, you put all those three groups together, who's not there? 
That's it. It covers everybody. It covers everybody. Yeah. And that's exactly what Jesus but taught God us. God so the loved the world. The world, yes, yes, absolutely. And we have that love poured into our hearts, mm -hmm. right? So we're supposed to treat people right. And that's not being done in Israel, okay? What does it mean to treat them right? With love, mm -hmm. okay? Love your neighbor as yourself. There are a lot of reasons you can give that are wrong reasons. Yes. Okay? Yes. You can give out of obligation. Mm -hmm. Do you pay taxes? Yeah. Because you just that's your I favorite just, thing to do. I don't like jail. <laughs> no, because you do because it you out of to. because you do it yeah. out of obligation. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we do. We do out of obligation. That doesn't make it wrong to do. No. But it certainly doesn't count in the love column. Right. I I don't think a lot of people love uh, inland revenue in England or IRS here in the states. It's not about love. It's about what you have to do. Okay. It's about receiving honor and glory. It's about the prestige of giving, philanthropy. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. A lot of people are philanthropic. In other words, they give a lot, but they don't do it without selfish motivation. All right. Think about what Jesus said in in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew six two. He said, "When you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets." so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. In other words, they're giving. They're doing all these things, but they're doing it to be seen because of their pride, mm. not because they have love for, you know, whoever is the recipient of that, okay? Um, the other thing is a lot of people give just to get. Now, I know the word says, as a man sows, so shall he reap. And from that truth, and that is the truth, so much heresy has come forth. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it's because people don't understand giving. All right? There's a give, difference between giving, and I, I, I know we've talked about this earlier in one of our studies, about giving and entrusting somebody. Yes. Okay? If you get a paycheck and you go down to the bank at the end of the week and deposit, your, you hand over your paycheck to mm -hmm. the cashier. You haven't given them anything. Mm -hmm. You have entrusted them with what is yours, and you have expectations to take care of it. If you have, a, if you make investments of any kind, and you have an investment broker, you go, you have a stockbroker, and you go and you write them a check for lots of money, and you hand them that check, you haven't given them anything. You have entrusted them with what is yours, with an expectation of getting a lot more back. That's why you do it, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, nothing's yours. It all belongs to God. For the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. You have nothing. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they know that. Okay. Yes. So if you're giving just for the purpose of getting greater back, that's not giving out of love. No. That's giving out of self-interest. That's giving out of selfishness. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it, it's become so common to see churches or ministries playing on that, saying, you know, send me your money. And God's going to give you, God's, and it's almost like they're saying God is now obligated to you. God owes you more. God owes you nothing. He owes you nothing. Not a, not a thing. And you, on the other hand, owe him everything. everything. Right? Absolutely. So it's, it's what's, God's not looking in your wallet. God's not looking in your pocketbook. God is looking in your heart. Searching our hearts. And, and he can see what's in your heart, okay? So Timothy wrote, 1 Timothy 6, 18, he said, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. That's to be the attitude of Christians. A giving heart, ready to share. And here is the primary reason that we should have a heart to give. Because in a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What you're doing, whatever you're doing, is supposed to be, the purpose should be to be bringing glory to God the Father. Not to be bringing glory to yourself, okay? It's all about doing things for God's glory. What verse is that? I didn't get that. I'm sorry, that's because I didn't say it. I think you did. Did I? Matthew 5, 16. Oh, okay. Okay. If you haven't read the uh, Sermon on the Mount in a while, mm -hmm. take some time this week and go do that, okay? So you can give simply for the Lord. Because, well, let me give you a scripture, mm -hmm. all right? 
Matthew 25, 40. It, this is what a parable Jesus was telling. He said, the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brethren, brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Matthew 25, 40, right? Mm -hmm. So when you are being generous, blessing others, you know, you're blessing the Lord. So if you have a heart to bless the Lord, what, what more needs to be done? What more needs to be said? Okay. Now, as I said when we started, true giving demonstrates the love or not true giving. When you're doing it for these selfish reasons, it demonstrates the love of self that was so prevalent in Israel. Something that always pushes aside the love of God. Love of self will always push aside the love of God. And you know what that is? Twice it says in Proverbs, and I'll read one, Proverbs 11, 1. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Can you picture the old scales they used to use, right? You put something on one side, goes up, the other goes down. It has to do that. It has to do that. Yes. John the Baptist said it best. Yes, he did. He said that he must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus can't go up unless we go down. Okay. Any glory we take to ourselves diminishes the glory that goes to God. Okay. But when there is nothing of ourselves and all of Jesus, we have attained that righteous and just balance in our lives. So that should be our goal, right? But you can see this was a true problem in Israel. The rich get rich, the poor get poor. What does it say in Revelations? There's a, a lot of things. Right? Yeah, but there's one passage where it says, um, the in, in a very backward way, um, it it takes a grain of, or it takes so so much to buy a, a day's wage or a day's food, a loaf of bread, right? and, and do not harm the yeah. olive oil. Yeah. That means the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. That's mm -hmm. and it's Isn't happening it? today. Everything is happening today. Is mm -hmm. this because this is the end? This is, yeah, it's mm -hmm. really close. Well, with that in mind, let me go on and read the next verse. Okay, Amos five thirteen, which says, "Therefore, at such time, the prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time." Mm -hmm. Well, it was assuredly an evil time. This is why God sent Amos from the south up to the north to prophesy. All right? All right. So let me just start from back to front, very Hebrew here in that verse. It's an evil time. Yes. Okay. I can't begin to enumerate, point out all the evil that is going on today in our time. The Lord would certainly be back before I got halfway through making a list, all right? Mm -hmm. But the world has always been evil, mm -hmm. ever since the fall of Adam, and we kicked out of the garden. I mean, everything was cursed then, all right? Yes. I think the issue here is the evil in the people of God, mm. okay? I don't, and neither should you, expect Righteous behavior from unrighteous people. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a tendency that uh, all too many Christians seem to have, right? However, it would certainly be reasonable to expect righteous behavior from righteous people. Yes. And that's the problem in Israel. Mm -hmm. These are the people of God, and yet there is this corruption. Like I said, it's moral corruption. It is religious corruption. It is political corruption. So here in the church, what I see, well, you know, think about what God spoke to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light, light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's in the church. That's, that's God that's speaking to his people. I mean... So often we got it upside down inside the church and we should not. So the prudent person, a prudent person, right? Cautious, I mean, on guard here. Keep silent. In Proverbs 9, 8, it says, do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. 
And then in 23, 9 in Proverbs, it says, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Well, does that mean you're never supposed to say anything? I mean, if the time is that, that evil? No. no, but it is. You have to be prayerful about what you're saying, okay? You don't want to cast your pearls before swine. Yeah, but there's more to it than that. In, in a time of, like I said, where there is such corruption, mm -hmm. political corruption, moral corruption, religious corruption, it would be very, very easy for us to start mumbling and grumbling and complaining mm -hmm. and participating with the world in grumbling about the the political party that you're opposed to, com you know, complaining and groaning about all of the evil that's going on, what good does that do? Nothing. It, it accomplishes nothing. And I think that's what God wants us to do, is to not do that. It says do all things without grumbling and complaining, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be a people of thanksgiving. So for the people of God to get involved in conspiracy theories and start complaining and mumbling and grumbling and groaning and complaining about this person who's in office, that person who's in office, this law that they make or that law that they make, realize that so much of the Bible was written in times when there were most horrible people in yeah, politics. So that doesn't, that does not in any way justify not doing what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to. How many times do you see in the New Testament the people of God complaining about the evil of, evilness of Caesar? whichever Caesar was in during that period of time. How often do you see that? Well, why not? I mean, they're worse than anybody we've had in office around here. It wasn't. Because it's not their position to do that. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said, and he's talking to the church, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, when I wrote to you not to judge, he said, what I meant was... Outsiders. Yeah, outsiders. Don't judge the outsiders. God's going to judge yes. the unbelievers, That's the outsiders. God's job. However, it is our job to judge the people yes. in the church. Yes. When I say judge, I mean that, you know, judgment doesn't have to be for evil. Mm -hmm. Okay? If they have contests, they have a judge, somebody's a winner. I mean, That's but it's a matter of appraising things spiritually. It says in 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty three, I think... Bad company destroys good, good morals. morals yes. So it's a way of weeding out people that well, it's not, that if you associate with will drag you down. Yeah, but part of part of the reason that we are supposed to deal with them, it says if you see your brother sin, right. okay, you're not supposed to go and pick at him. You're not supposed to try and you know it's what you're saying. Back. It's for, supposed to be for his restoration. Absolutely. And now bear in mind that the whole purpose of Amos here. That we've seen over the weeks of you. By the way, if, you, if you've missed some of these, they are available on the website still uh, on BibleTalk.com. The, the, the point is, that was God's purpose. To he kept saying, He was doing this, to, but the, yet they did not return to me. Mm -hmm. He did this, and yet they did not return to right. me. But God's desire always was to restore them. Right. God desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life, all right? So that's His purpose. Even when it gets to that point where you have to cut somebody out and send them out of the church, yeah. the purpose is still for restoration. for restoration. I mean, that's clear in Scripture. Yes. Now, the unfortunate part is today you can, you can tell somebody, you know, if, they're, if they continue in sin, unrepentant in the body, God has a process. Jesus said it. Go to him and him alone. If he doesn't listen, take somebody else. He still doesn't listen. Bring it before the body. Right. And if they still don't listen, cast them, out. cast them out. But the purpose is that being out, they will come to their senses right. and come back to be restored in repentance. Okay? Remember, there's an appointed time for everything. Okay? Mm -hmm. And there's a time for every event under heaven. Mm -hmm. But it also says in, that, in, in verse 6 of Ecclesiastes yes. 3 that there's a time to search and a time to give up as lost. Yes. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Okay? So don't, don't believe that you have unlimited time. Okay? You know, Isaiah said this. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. Isaiah 60, verse 2. Uh, I would say... 
and maybe it's symbolic that in the near future here we're going to have a, another a solar eclipse, which is mm. a fairly rare uh, event. Well, darkness happens every night. What we're talking about is spiritual, right? Yes. And there's a spiritual darkness that covers the earth. But then he said deep darkness covers the people. Now, the Hebrew word, now, by the way, the King James says gross darkness. Uh, the the uh, English Standard Version says thick dark, darkness. It's like a fog. Well, it is. That's It's like a, a wet Darkness. It's a fog, mm -hmm. all right? And there's a difference between darkness and fog. Right. Well, let me... Mm -hmm. If you went into a football stadium that was pitch black and, and lit a candle, every eye would turn towards you. I mean, light becomes very visible in darkness. But have you ever driven in thick fog? I mean, yes. have you ever been in San Francisco? Have you ever been up in... The uh, New England states when it's, see and and your headlights you turn your headlights on and they go two feet out and bounce right back at you and they can't penetrate it at all. Well, that's the time that I believe we're coming to, when the light of God is not penetrating into the, because because they have rejected the word of God and there comes a famine for the hearing of the words of God. In Isaiah sixty verse two, I've got the definitions. And it says, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. The words for the two darkness are two different words. Yes, I know. One is darkness and one is yeah, a, a wet yeah, darkness, yeah, yeah, which is a thick darkness, which is a fog. It literally says yeah. cloud, cloud. Yeah, cloud. And light doesn't penetrate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's coming a time when the light won't penetrate. Okay. Let, let's go on to the next couple of verses. I want to I want to try and move along here, okay? All right. In Amos 5, 14 and 15, because this is going on, right, this time, the word says, Seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Right? Right. Back to the remnant. Seek good and not evil. You know, you spiritually, you're always in the midst of that decision. You're either you're either seeking choices good, constant. it's constantly choices. You know, it's like uh, out in the wilderness, the valley of decision. Uh, yeah, choose you to stay. Whom you will serve. Isn't that what Joshua said? Mm -hmm. You got you got to make a choice. Okay, but seek good and hate evil. That's that's the distinction. You know, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's what it yes. says in Proverbs 8, 8, 13, right? People today tolerate Well, the people evil. today don't have a fear of the Lord. No, they don't. I mean, that was very evident in the time of Amos. I mean, here, God is bringing all of this disaster upon the people. Doesn't, you know, hey, just they get through it. They have no fear of the Lord. and But that fear of the Lord is not to be, God doesn't want us deathly afraid of him. But we should certainly be in absolute awe of him. I mean, we're, when you come into the presence of God, you know what should happen? You should fall flat on your face. I mean, we it's hard to conceive of the holiness of God, okay? We should be in awe of God. There should be a fear of God in our life, and that will lead you to hate evil, all right? Just let me just talk for a second about the, uh, the remnant. <clears throat> I was just thinking about the fact that today people are accepting everything. I mean, they're accepting the cults, the different, the things that are going horribly wrong in the church, and everybody is accepting this. And it's like it's all coming together to build that one world religion. It is, and it it, it starts with the fact that there is no awe of God, no fear of right. God, and and the, we're, we're being led astray by anything. But that's exactly what the Word of God prophesied. It just proves it. The word is true. I mean, Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 4. And he said, in the, in the last days, and the, he's talking about the perilous last days, which these are. Mm -hmm. He said, men, will, and men, the church, will not endure sound, sound doctrine. Right. Right. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll choose for themselves teachers according to their own desires. That's what's happening in the church today. Now, that's not a brand new phenomenon. No, it's been going on. But in matter of degree... 
I think it's significant today, today right? More so. Okay, but it says, seek him while he may be found, mm -hmm. right? In Mark chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 35 to 37. It says that Jesus, talking about Jesus, says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. That was his habit, by the way. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Well, think about that a minute. Actually, the word that's used here in Greek, is search for search is to hunt right. to hunt it that's literally what it means in the, in the hebrew or greek to hunt after to hunt down all right if you've ever been out in the bush right, you, you know there's a difference between looking and hunting hunting is an effort it requires diligence okay you got you just go out and start looking at the woods mm. you, that doesn't take any effort we have to we have to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. We have to have a burning desire to see the Lord. If we're gonna if we're gonna see him, right? Mm -hmm. So it says, seek the Lord while he may be found, while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what it says in Hebrews 11, 6. Do we diligently seek him? I mean, going to a church building on Sunday morning once a week, I don't, that, I, I don't know that he'll call that diligent, mm -hmm. seeking him. Well, we're supposed to, they're coming together as the gathering of the believers. Well, but it's, it it's starts not, with a gathering for, him. for us to have an intimate relationship with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, our desire should be to have that personal, intimate relationship with the Lord God Almighty Absolutely. through the atoning work of his son, Christ Jesus. Christianity is not about pipe organs, padded pews, and great big brick buildings. Christianity is about a love relationship Jesus. with Jesus Christ. That's right. he, I'm my beloved's and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom that we are now awaiting. If you're not in love with him, you're not going to seek him out. You know, you may go visit once in a while. I promise you, going to visit the Lord once a, once a while, maybe once a week, twice a week, that's not love. No. I got to tell you, I, I don't think I would be happy if I only saw Alice once a week. That would be horrible. That would be horrible. My sweet patootie. <laughs> Well, you better do it, but you better think about it, because we are now out of time once oh again. Oh, my goodness, again. Time flies when you're having fun. So, Father, we just thank you thank for, you, for this time in your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would draw us nearer and nearer to you, that you would open uh, our ears, dig out our ears, that you open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see wonderful things in your word, that we would see your son, Christ Jesus, more and more clearly, day by day. Oh and be more like him. Amen. Amen. Well, till next week, why don't you come visit us online at www.bibletalk.com or write to us at office at bibletalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. God bless and goodbye till next time. Jesus loves you. I cherish that old rugged Please.